All right, James chapter 2. James, the brother of Jesus, is the one who wrote this book. It's a pretty short book, but it is one that should bring... uh, it definitely gives us an opportunity to reflect on ourselves. And if you haven't already been adjusted just as we've started this book, and we've only gone through chapter one, you will be. So we're, we're coming up on some pretty poignant things. And, and uh, if we get through the whole chapter today, we'll even kind of get into um, – whether or not this contradicts, is James contradicting Paul uh, when we get to, it will compare verses in Ephesians uh, compared to chapter 2 here. So, but we'll see if we get that far. I make promises and then we don't even come close. So, uh, James chapter 2. He's already uh, prepared us to, to face trials. Uh, define trial from tr- from temptation, understanding that we have to endure both. Um, not always, not always. It's not always easy, and, and quite frankly, I mean, he refers to trials as fiery trials. So, um, if we think that uh, a trial from the Lord is something that's going to be easy and not challenging at all, uh, that God would never push his children very far uh, we're mistaken and all we have to do to see that is Job when you go back to to Job we find out God our father is perfectly willing to really challenge us and the purpose of it is to grow our patience Um, you know I got to to share that with a, a young man this weekend where he was telling me how he was struggling with uh, not knowing certain things and not always understanding. I mean, this he's literally a boy. He's 14 years old, I think, 15. I mean, and, and so he, he just, he gets frustrated when he doesn't understand something. And he's a pretty smart kid. That's probably why. Um, so I just told him, I said, you know, this is, this is to grow your patience. You're you're coming into this time, and God is, you know, in my opinion, preparing him to be a man, and growing his patience. And told him, you're not always going to get the answer you want, or you're not always going to get all of the answers. And I pointed that out. I took him to Job and said, "Look, Job goes through all this in the beginning. He doesn't know why, and at the end, God never tells him. I mean, we don't know if God met with Job later." And explained everything that happened in that story, how it began in heaven, in the throne room of God. And then Job wrote the book. We don't know who wrote the book. If it was somebody else who was standing by and and observed everything and God spoke to them and and let them know what had happened in these two meetings between the Lord and Satan. And how this all came about. But as far as we know, at the end of the book, God didn't tell Job, here, this this is what happened. To try to bring him some relief. He asked him 61 questions that Job couldn't answer and just left it at that. You know, and Job has to admit, hey, you know, and, and he already knows. He's, he's, he expresses it all through the book, but he already knows that God is God and God will do what God will do. And he's left with that ultimate revelation at the end, even though he's expressed it throughout the book. At, even in the end, though, Job is still... Who am I? You know, and so I got to share that uh, with this young man to, to say, "Hey, you may not even ever get an a, a answer to a why question from God." You know, and it, I said, "But it, it's just to grow your patience, your patience with God, to to trust in Him more than your own understanding." And uh, so. We have that, and we we have the trials, we have the the temptations that we endure. We endure by the power of God and not of our own strength. We're encouraged at the end of chapter one to be hearers and not or not to 
not to just be hearers, but to be doers of God's word. So to, to begin to put what we know into action. Now, to, to do that, we have to pray for wisdom. And again, James has told us that God gives to all liberally who ask. He, he, he doesn't just say, hey, you need to you need to get into God's word. You need to be in the scriptures. You need to know the scriptures and then you need to walk in them. He says, you need to ask for wisdom first, and this is why you need to ask for wisdom. One, God will give it to you. Two, here's why. You need to be able to walk in his word. You need to be able to make decisions concerning your life and 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 how you live and, and, and where you go. And it's not just from the knowledge of the words of God. Many people can quote multiple verses from the Bible. But they live like they have no understanding of the Bible. You, you, you rarely hear somebody who quotes the word really expound on it at all. They, they have no wisdom about it. They have knowledge. But knowledge isn't very active if you don't have wisdom to be able to put it into action. You know, we used to see this in, in guys when I was in the military working on airplanes. And you had guys that could go out, look at a part, look at a place, and just and put it in there. You had other guys who were book smart, made rank faster than all of us. They'd go take a test, man, and, and they would they would pass the test, achieve the rank. It would you know be time before they could put it on, but every time they tested for rank, they made it. But they they couldn't. They didn't have any practical understanding of how things work. They couldn't change a part, even with a book sitting in front of them. They were book smart, but they weren't practically smart, and they really struggled in that. And then you had other guys that were practically smart, and we just weren't very book smart. It, to test for rank, you tested four or five times before you made it. So it's just it's just how it is. We're, we're wired differently, but there's a, a, a an understanding that happens. That's Wisdom is part of understanding and being able to put the knowledge that we acquire from studying God's Word into action in our life. It affects how we parent. It affects how we interact with one another. And now we're going to get into that. He ends chapter 1 with pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So to be able to go out and, and not wait for orphans and widows to come to us, but to be able to go out and visit them where they're at, those who are in need, those who have no support, those who, who really need interaction with somebody but don't have a means to be able to do that, to go out and visit them and do that and take care of them and look over or look after them, and at the same time, keep yourself unspotted from the world. So we have to make these trips out into the world where there are hurting people. Where there are people who are in need of the word of God and come back unspotted and undefiled by that. Now, you're going to get your hands dirty. If you're going to go out and you're going to you're going to shake hands with somebody, you're going to look them in the eyes, you're going to you're going to say what do you need? And, and, and we're going to see. He's going to address that today. But you're going to interact with them. You're going to enter into their life. You're going to make yourself an emissary of God. You, you're going to take the love of Jesus outside of the building, outside of our houses, to our neighbors, to our neighborhoods, and represent God and come back undefiled. Too often the church thinks we got to go out, we got to look like them, and we got to act like them, and we got to be like them in order to get their attention. And while I believe we do have to be able to relate to them, and we can because we ourselves are sinners but saved by grace, we know what it is to be trapped in sin. But we don't go out and participate in it, we don't go out and fake it or make it look like we do. And bring them in that way. 
We go out and we still are the righteousness of God before other people. We're the salt. We're the light. We go out into their into the world. We go out into the darkness and we take light with us and we come back without any kind of shadow hanging on us. You know, if you go out into this neighborhood and somebody invites you in and you go into their home, it could happen. It's happened to me before, not in this neighborhood, but to go and visit somebody and say, hey, you want a beer? No, no it's all right. I, I don't need a beer. You know, glass of water be fine. You know, just something like that. And, you know, you, you don't, oh, I don't drink beer, man. That's, that's, you know, not supposed to get drunk, not supposed to, not supposed to be under the influence of that stuff and start ramming it into them, the legalities of it. Just, no, I don't, I don't need that. That's fine. Just, just talk, visit, be a part of the world. Let them see the difference. And that's a small difference. And, man, if they can see that small difference without being offended because you're not all pious about it, just, no, it's all right. But there are people, man, if somebody cracked one open, They'd get up and leave. Nah, I can't be around us. I'm, I'm, I'm gone. You obviously don't really want to know about Jesus. Well, you obviously really don't want to tell them about Jesus if you can't get past that. You know? I mean, I'm not suggesting you, well, I don't know, maybe we need to more often go out and preach to drunk people. I don't know. But they, they tend to get a little more emotional about things anyways. <laughs> But anyhow, getting kind of off track here with this. The point is, don't go out and, and get, you're supposed to be unspotted by the world. And it's hard. It's hard to be on Facebook and be unspotted by the world. There's so many things out there, so much craziness, and, and we feel like we have to, and there's your problem right there, is your feel word. We feel like we have to respond to it. And really what you want is you just want to vent. And, and venting comes across as judgment. It comes across not as judgment as is this is right or this is wrong, but judgment as in condemnation. And the idea that somebody is no longer worthy of redemption. We need to be careful about that. Because listen, you go out and you get angry. And that's all you do is you're just angry. To the point that you're not going to go anymore. You're not going to talk to people anymore. It's just useless to try. Then you're, you've been spotted by the world. You've taken on the spots of the world. If we return the attitude that they have toward Jesus. Jesus warns us before he goes to the cross. If they hate me, they're going to hate you. He warns us about that. But he never said, when they hate you, you get to hate them back. It's quite the opposite, isn't it? Love those who hate you. Pray for those who persecute you. Right? I mean, he went through a whole, if this is how they are toward you, this is how you are toward them. And it's not the same thing. It's not a mirror image of the world. It's not a righteous wrong. They wronged me, so now in the name of Jesus, I get to wrong them back. Or I get to, I get to be silent now because I don't want to cast my pearls before a swine. Listen, there's a context of that verse, of that, of that thing that Jesus said. It's not... You know, the world hates God, the world is against God, so I'm just going to shut up and hole up and wait for the rapture. That's not what we're supposed to do. When he comes back, we're supposed to be about our Father's business. And Jesus set that example for us. When he was 13 in the temple and mom and dad forgot about him, you know, they're in the caravan on the way home. Probably not even hanging out together. 
with family members, with friends, cousins, come back together in the evening. Hey, hey, where's Jesus? I, I thought you had him. I thought you had him. Huh, now we got to go back. And they go back to Jerusalem, and they find him in the temple. And they said, what are you doing? He said, didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? Listen, that should be the same for us. When he comes back, we're not supposed to be kicking it on top of a hill in a lawn chair with a glass of iced tea waiting for Jesus to come back. We're supposed to be active. We're supposed to be interacting. We're supposed to be getting the word of salvation, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ out to the minute we hear that trumpet blow. That's our mission. That's our commission. It, it's not to just hole up. It's not to get off grid where everybody, you know, nobody can touch us, nobody can see us. And by the way, there, that's a fallacy. I'm convinced of it. You might think you're off grid. They know exactly where everybody is. But that's a whole other deal. But here's the deal. That's not, that's not where we're supposed to do. That's not where we're supposed to go. You know, there's a time and there's a, a circumstance and there's a place to hide. But you know what? In the persecuted church where everybody meets underground and when they sing worship music, they don't ever actually let their voice come out because they can't be heard. Because if they're heard, then the police come in and arrest them and all. And in those places, the church is growing. They're not holding up and staying small and staying a few people. It's growing. This part of the frustration of the governments that are trying to suppress the truth is they can't. And part of what's weakened the church here in America has probably been our freedom of speech. Because we decided, we, we decided we can't offend anybody. We can't say words that offend people. So we say words and we dance around the truth. And, and, and now as we have that right limited, now we're saying, oh, you can't suppress my right to speech, my freedom of speech. You can't. And we're concerned about the right. We're, we're concerned about that instead of just doing it. You can't tell me I can speak about Jesus. You tell me I can't pray out loud. You tell me I can't pray in the name of Jesus. I'm going to get louder about it. And, and I get it, amen, but are we going to be louder about it? Are you, are you, it's not about the right, our constitutional right to freedom of speech. It's about do we deliver the gospel of Jesus Christ in spite of the law? In spite of what the world wants, do we deliver it anyways? Or do we only do it in safe zones? You know, a couple of years ago when these safe zones got real popular in colleges and they, they could say whatever they want and then run to their safe zone and play with their color books and crayons and nobody could say anything mean to them. They couldn't disagree with them. And that was really, you know... And we shake our head, and, oh, my goodness, and we call them snowflakes, and we're like, oh, these kids are just so weak-minded now. Christians sit in churches every week, and we say nothing when we go out. This is our safe zone. And we treat our Bibles like color books. You all got highlighters, and you're highlighting verses. But are you sharing them outside of the building, outside of the safe zone? You know, the church has become a bunch of snowflakes. James is no snowflake here. He's in Jerusalem. He's facing the religious leaders of, of Israel day in and day out. He is the half-brother of Jesus, and they know it. And he is the leader of a church. And he's no snowflake. And he's not afraid of the people that he leads either. 
he wants them to know. God does it. My, my brother expects you to change. He expects you to be different in spite of persecution or in spite of acceptance. He expects you to be different. Now, he expects you to love. And, and I guess it's time to get into chapter 2, actually, right? He expects us to do this in love. My brethren, verse 1, my brethren, do not be... Do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings a fine in, in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, this was a thing with the Pharisees. Remember when we went through Matthew, there were times when Jesus went to the house of the Pharisee and he would go and he would sit and eat with them. We like to point out that Jesus would hang out with the poor people and that he would hang out with the sick and he would touch them and he would heal them. But he also hang, hung out with the religious people. It was all the sinners, wealthy and poor. And he would sit there. And then you would have the poor people come in, a woman who would come in and weep on his feet and wash his feet with her hair. And the Pharisee in his heart's going, man, if he knew who was touching him, he would. And Jesus is like, hey, you didn't wash my feet. It's your house. This is your responsibility. You didn't wash my feet. But she hasn't stopped. So this was a thing, man. They would have these big feasts. They would have their, their meals out in courtyards or whatever where people could see and, and it was a place where the, the poor could gather and, and you know look and hope for scraps and hope for hope for something, some kind of recognition, some kind of need to be met. And they would make great big huge deals out of the fact that they were doing it. Whether they gave to somebody through through coins at them or gave them food or whatever. It it was to make a show of themselves. And, and James is saying, you, you show partiality to the, to the rich. They were, they were falling into that. To those who, who had stuff, you come in. Well, we need to honor this guy because that was the thing. You, know, you honored the Pharisees. You honored the Sadducees because they were the priests and the Levites in the temple. And the Pharisees were the scribes and the lawyers, the ones who kept the law of God, who, who transcribed the laws of God, kept the scriptures whole. You honor them, right? Because they had great responsibility before God, and that was ingrained in them as Jews. But now they're free from Judaism, and yet they still are giving preference to those who, who have. And we're going to make them feel more welcome. And we're going to give them places of honor. And, and we're going to do for them. And the person who, who isn't, who's dirty, whose clothes aren't, you know, aren't, aren't great. Maybe they're a little tore, a little worn out. Maybe they, you know, they come from Goodwill or Salvation Army, whatever. And we're like, all right, hey, you know what? We got the we got the guy we got to honor over here. We're gonna keep you back over here. Or maybe to make a show, instead of you standing over there like you're some kind of servant, how about you just come and sit at my feet? And then he he sees the guy of honor sees that you know I have your respect. And and we still do it. If somebody comes to a church and and we we decide there's somebody who deserves honor, we bring them to the front. How embarrassing that is! Because I had it happen to me because they knew I was a pastor. And one of my brothers set me up. 
He knew it would happen, and he let them know. He thought it was funny. I kind of thought it was funny, but they were dead serious about it. And I was embarrassed. And honestly, I didn't feel bad for me. I mean, I was laughing about it. I thought it was kind of funny because it's religious. It's just religious. You clear they you clear out a whole row of people so me and my family can come and sit down in the front. This is what James is talking about. I didn't deserve that. I got there late for crying out loud. It's not like I got there and reserved the front row and somebody sat in my seat. We came in late. We're standing in the back. It's standing room only. I'm perfectly fine with that. You know, my family's good with it. We, oh, no, no. He didn't bring you up here. We clear everybody else out. Now these poor people who thought they had a good seat going to sit up front, ready to honor God in a worship service, and they get moved out so I can sit down there. That's ridiculous. And this is what James is talking about. You don't do that. We don't, we shouldn't do that. You don't, you don't move somebody out of a seat because it's a better spot in your mind and, and put somebody that you've decided has great value and set them there and clear out somebody you think is a little less. And that's what they were doing. He's saying, you, you've shown partiality, and it's the reality of it. It's, it's the same gospel that saves both people. It's the same good news. Jesus died for both of them. He's willing to forgive the sins of both of them equally across the board. He doesn't forgive more sin of the rich guy than he does, well, maybe he does, of the poor guy. Maybe he does. I don't know. But he's not more inclined to forgive the rich guy than he is the poor guy, nor is he more inclined to forgive the poor guy than he is the rich guy. So let's not flop this all the way around because that happens too. Because when you have situations like that, now animosity builds in the heart of the one who's considered less. And they look at the other person who's been given this place of honor, unduly given. And they have animosity toward that person. And then they have animosity toward toward the people who did it. And they have, you know, and there's this back and forth and... And pretty soon you've got two classes of people that are at war with one another. And I'm telling you now, our system in this country is really good at fostering that and promoting it. And so is our church because of that. We build big buildings and we have carpet and we have all this luxury stuff in our church in our buildings and we want to make sure that nobody gets it dirty remember a story about pastor chuck they just put new carpet in the sanctuary and a bunch of the hippies come in and they just sat in there they come in barefoot off the beach off the street sit down on the floor they don't even sit in the chairs they go ahead and sit out on the floor and, and the elders were like, we can't let that happen anymore, man. They're going to get our new carpet clean. Or dirty, I mean. They're going to get clean. No. <laughs> More likely. But we can't let them do that. The carpet's going to get dirty. And, and Pastor Chuck said, well, you got a problem with that. Then rip the carpet out. If that's what's going to keep us from letting people come in here with their dirty feet and sit on our carpet, then rip it out. And we begin to judge each other when we show this partiality. He says in verse 4, judges, uh, I'm sorry, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brother. God has not chosen the poor of this world to, to be rich in faith and, or I'm sorry, I'm reading that wrong. Listen, my beloved brother. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? And heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. 
to those who love God, to those who accept his word, who accept the gospel. And, and by the way, I don't care how rich you are in this world. I don't care how much you have. You are dirt poor compared to what's coming. The, to, if, if you walk with the Lord and you walk in the knowledge and the wisdom of the Lord here, if you are, are actively seeking the lost, proclaiming the gospel, making disciples, if you're doing those things, serving one another, serving people. You are storing up a wealth in heaven, a reward for you in heaven that is so far beyond what you can imagine. The the poorest person in heaven is going to far overshadow all of the rich people on this earth that have ever lived altogether. They're heirs of the kingdom. That means they're our brothers and our sisters. The gospel is there for both. Verse 6 says, but you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do not they blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? Listen, if you're you're afraid to preach the whole good news, the whole message of God, if I become afraid, if if a local politician came in and sat down, if the police chief came and sat down, the fire chief came and sat down in our church on a Sunday morning, and I changed what I was going to say because I didn't want them to think I was judging them. I didn't want to offend them by the word of God. Then I would be wrong. There was a preacher, and I don't remember his name, but he was warned that one of the presidents was coming. And I want to say it was Madison, but I'm not sure. President came in, sat in the back row. This man was known for preaching hard hitting messages of what God expects of those. Delivering the gospel, but not pulling any punches. And he was told, I mean, the president's coming, so you want to be careful of what you say. And right in front of the president, preached his message with, and, and basically. With a conclusion of, and I don't care if you're the president of the United States. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to hell. It's something like that. I don't think those are exact words, but it was something like that. Well, I hope that I would still do it. If the president came here, just showed up, unannounced, man. And, and we would have to make some adjustments for him. Right? He's the president of the United States. He's going to have a whole entourage with him. But my goal would have to be as many of those who could be and were willing would be saved that day. Right up to the president. All of the Secret Service guys. Everybody. I tell them, you guys kind of got guys outside this building, man, turn on your little earpieces so they can hear this too. I don't have to tell them the truth. I don't pull any punches with that. Because the same gospel is to reach that man as it is to reach the lowest person in this neighborhood. I don't care who it is. I don't care what dignitary it would be. And to show them an honor that would dishonor anybody else. If we were not willing, if he came in here and, and we had some some folks come in from the neighborhood, it was their first time, if we pushed them aside for him, one, that would be wrong. We would, we would make the necessary arrangements that had to be done for security and all that business, but they got guys that do that. 
But if I got off of this stage and I had the opportunity to go and shake his hand, that I didn't take those people with me, I'd be wrong. Do not blaspheme the noble name. So they're they're honoring people who are not Christians. People who are willing to blaspheme the name of God. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, and this makes me believe that this is this is the honoring of Pharisees and Sadducees. This is honoring the religious elite. They're not even talking about a king. We're talking about the religious elite, the Pharisees. They're still catering to them. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love the Lord, or you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. You can get more straightforward than that, do you? I don't really need to expound on that. If you're not loving, loving your neighbor as yourself, and we do, we love ourselves, we take care of ourselves, we make sure we're full. We may have manners and not grab the last bite until we're sure nobody else is going to grab it. We're going to make sure that we're full. Okay? We're going to make sure our hair is neat. We're going to make sure we love ourselves so much we want to make sure we're presentable for everybody else to love. But do we love them the same way? No, he said, if you do this, you do well. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. And, and uh, Luke chapter 10 and Mark chapter 12, you have the instance where one of the young rulers, probably a Pharisee, comes to Jesus and says, Lord, Jesus, what, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, hey, you know, let me read it. Mark's a pretty good, uh, we're going to get into Mark in a couple of <laughs> months the way this is going, but. Let me see. Thought I had it marked. Maybe I don't. Goodness. I said it was Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, starting with verse 28, says, Then one of the scribes, so Pharisee, and having heard them reasoning together, Jesus interacting with some others before this, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? So the greatest commandment of all. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it, or the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. You notice Jesus didn't just stop with love God. We like to. We like to do that. I love God. I love his word. I'm so glad that he saved me. It's awesome. It is, his word speaks to me. I love to worship. And we stop. And Jesus says it's like it. The next commandment, the second commandment is like it. It's because you, you can't do the second commandment unless you're already doing the first commandment. But if you're truly loving God, if you're truly seeking after him, then the second commandment is an automatic. Right? Love your neighbor as yourself. 
There is no other commandment greater than these. You know, and we have other commandments in the New Testament. One of them is don't forsake the gathering together of believers. And we'll, we'll hit on that because we want people to come and, hey, this is where we encourage one another. This is where we get into God's word together. We pray for each other. We, we learn together. But guess what? That's not as great as love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself is above that commandment to gather together. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. There is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Man, the the religious... The religious acts, the the sacrifices, the going to the temple, giving the alms, making the sacrifices, picking out your lamb or whatever your sacrifice was going to be, all of that was very important to them. It was huge to them. But this guy, this scribe says, you're right, loving God. And loving those around me by showing the love of God to them? And he understood there there is only one God. This is the truth. And to do all of these things, there's nothing higher than that for us to do. Not even the sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. Now, I wonder which one of these Pharisees this is that's saying this to him. Who asked him the question? Was it Nicodemus who finally was brave enough to do something in public? Was it Joseph of Arimathea who was finally brave enough to say something in public? I don't get the impression that this this particular person was trying to trip Jesus up. I think he really wanted to know. You've answered everybody else wisely. You've gotten around their riddles. You've gotten around all their tricks and their trip-ups. I want to know the truth. What's the greatest commandment? He says, well said, teacher, you've spoken the truth. And Jesus said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And James now, his brother, all these years later, some years later, says, this is the royal law. If you really fulfill the royal law, if you do what my brother, the king, has commanded us to do. And this is how it will play out. But if you don't, you've committed sin. And you're convicted by the law as as transgressors. For whoever shall keep, back in James now, whoever shall keep the whole law yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. For he said... Do not commit adultery. Also said, for he who said do not commit adultery, also said do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So so speak and so do as those who will judge by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So you break the law, man. You break the law. The law is whole. It's not ten laws. 
the Levitical law was not, you know, this law for this sacrifice, this law for that sacrifice, this, you know, and it, it was, it was broken down and defined, but it was one law. And you don't get to break any of it because if you do, you've broken the law. Listen, if you go out here and you drive 100 miles an hour down 131, you're going to go to jail, I hope. You know, you're going to get busted for reckless driving. You've got your kids in the back seat, you should get busted for child endangerment. And I don't care if you're a Christian or not. You've broken the law. You're in the same place. You're going to the same court. You're going to see the same judge as if you break any other aspect of the law. And so for us to look at God's law and say, well, this is a little less than that. So this is okay. And this is my interpretation of what God said. Guess what, man? You are going to the same judge. James is saying here, man, you you may not commit adultery, but if you murder you're going to the same judge. You're going to be judged by the same law. So how is that? Well, because the beginning of that law says you should have no other gods before me. It's all about your relationship with God. The first half of the Ten Commandments. You should have no other gods before me, no graven images, keep the Sabbath, all of this. Remember, keep a holy day for me. Remember me. Don't forget me. If you don't keep that right, the last half you can't keep at all. But the same God who's going to judge is judging all of it. And the playing field is leveled. It doesn't matter if you are rich or poor. If you're guilty of murder, you're guilty of murder. If you're guilty of adultery, you're guilty of adultery. And what I find very interesting is James uses the same two examples that his brother used in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said, Jesus said, that you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, if you look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. You're guilty. You've heard it say said that you shall not murder. But I'm telling you that if you have anger in your heart towards your brother, you have already committed murder in your heart. You're guilty. I gotta wonder how much James was on the peripheral of some of those of some of those crowds. How much did he hear what his brother said? How close was he? Well, close enough that his brother goes to him. Jesus goes to him after the resurrection and, and, and sees him and meets with him. Just him and his brother. Him and his younger brother. A one-on-one. -on -one. Hey, guess what? And I've got something for you to do now, little brother. He says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Now you. You're judging between two people in your church. You have mercy for one and not the other. You have, you show honor and imply mercy to the one who is wealthy and you show dishonor and no mercy to the one who is without? One is worthy of honor. One is not worthy of being saved. One is worthy of the gospel. The other is not. Because of their position in society? No, they both need the gospel. Man, if God puts you in front of rich people, it better be the same gospel that comes out of your mouth if you are before poor people. It better be the same one. Or you're showing partiality. You're judging one more worthy than the other. 
mercy triumphs over judgment. You see, we all start judgment. We all start heading toward the throne of judgment. We all start off heading toward that great white throne judgment where the books are going to be open and everything that we do is going to be laid out for everybody to see. Now, whether everybody is me and Jesus or you and Jesus or whatever, if it's, it's going to be just between you and him. I don't know if this is really going to be the open court. We'd like to make that picture like that. But it's going to be laid open. Everything that we've done. If you don't know Jesus, that's where you're heading for. Because that's what you've been left. And you're going to be judged by the law. And there's not going to be any mercy on that day. Judgment's coming. But you have an opportunity now, by the grace of God, to escape the judgment of God and know the mercy of God. The apostles regularly open their books with greetings and grace and mercy or grace and peace to you. And there's a, a purposeful order to that. Grace comes first, man. You take the grace of Jesus. You take the forgiveness of your sin. You take, you have his favor then on your life without earning it. If you have that, you have the mercy so that when you're heading to the judgment seat, he's going to say, nope, not you. You have my mercy. Your name is written here in the Lamb's Book of Life. Case closed. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Over judgment. So judgment is going to lead to death. It's going to lead to an eternity in the lake of fire. An eternity separated from God. Forever. You'll still live forever, but it won't be what ACDC tries to make it look like it's going to be. There is no party in hell. I don't even believe you're going to be able to interact with anybody. It talks of personal torment. And part of it is hearing the torment of the others. But you will not be able to bring relief to one another. There will be no encouragement to one another. It's going to be a horrifying existence. But mercy triumphs over that. The mercy of God says, no, you can enter into the kingdom. You're now an heir to the kingdom. My grace has brought you mercy. My grace has brought you peace. We'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. And, and we can only, I mean, listen, if you are tired right now, so tired, and some of you are, I see your eyes closed. I see the head bob. I don't care if it's a big crowd or a small crowd. It goes through like a wave at a baseball stadium. Everybody does this, and it just passes through. I get it. You go home today, you kick back, put on a game, put on whatever, sitting in the lazy boy or laying in bed, and you go to sleep, and you're going, oh, finally I get to rest. Whatever you experience this afternoon won't compare to the rest that we have when we enter into the presence of God. It won't compare. It's going to be something you've never experienced before. What does it profit, my brethren? Verse 14. If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? I'm not sure we got time enough to get into this. If the if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, "Depart in peace, be warmed and filled," but you do not give them the things which uh, which are needed for the body, what does it profit? What good is it? It 
Listen, you can tell them be warm and be filled in the name of Jesus and send them out the door, but you don't put a blanket on it and some food in their stomach, then you've done nothing. You've done nothing. If, if we have the means to meet a need and we don't, and I think John writes about this, if we have the means to, to, to meet a need and we don't meet it, we've done nothing. You know, having a building with a name on it so people can come and hear some encouraging words and we identify with the good man Jesus with the loving God and so we let our soft words our soft spoken words speak to you and we're going to send you on your way man you have a great day I hope you got encouraged today be warm and be filled we don't do anything to, to physically meet that need. We might as well take the name off the building. That's not why we're here. That's not why any church is supposed to be there. And there are a lot of churches out there that think they're meeting needs that they're not. They got, they got. Xbox and PlayStation in the kids' areas and bounce houses and everything else, and they're going to feed their ADD is what they're doing. They aren't feeding them Jesus. Churches used to run buses to pick up kids. You don't hardly see that anymore. Now if they have buses, they have the big motor coaches so they can go places and do things as a church. They didn't have anything to do with going out into the neighborhood and picking up the kids that can't get there. Because we have a presence in a neighborhood, on a street, does not mean we're meeting the needs of that neighborhood. Listen, I, I get it. We, we bang our head trying to figure out what we're going to do. I'm telling you right now, if we're going to stay here, we better figure it out. We got to figure it out. There's a world of need. And we're small, but we got to figure it out. Not so we can grow inside this building. So the love of God gets outside of this building. It's got to happen in our personal neighborhoods at home where we live. It's got to happen in our homes. It's got to happen in our families. And it's got to happen in this neighborhood as a church. we got to figure it out. I had somebody ask me to do something on Tuesday, but I'm canceling it. We have a prayer meeting on Tuesday. We're going to figure it out. Tuesday night, 6 o'clock, right here. We're going to meet. I'll be here. And we're going to figure it out. I know we're live and this isn't for everybody. But even if we're gone in a couple of months, we're going to go out swinging. We gotta figure it out. So, what profit is it? What do we gain? If someone says he has faith but does not have works, Verse 17 says, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's dead. It's a dead faith. It's a worthless faith. We have talked a lot going through Hebrews and going through Matthew. And we've talked about faith and we've talked about believing and we've talked about, about uh, 
what real faith is. We talk about it a lot here because we stay in God's word. We go verse by verse. You can't get away from believing in, in true faith in Jesus Christ. And not some make-believe thing and that you don't have to confess your sin and you don't have to. That's all there. We, we nail that. This is where it gets hard. And this is where people start saying that James contradicted Paul. Faith by itself, does, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Now, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse, so verse 8, Paul says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I agree, and I think James agrees. You're not saved by faith, or by, by works. You're saved by faith. You're saved by grace through faith. Those two things working together. That's how you're saved. And it's not by works. It's not because you get baptized. It's not because you come to church every week. It's not because you teach a Sunday school class or sing in a choir or sing in a worship band. It's not because mom and dad are saved or Christians or you grew up a Christian or you live in America. None of that makes you saved. The numbers are still high in America in the, in the, in the, um, the surveys about how many people believe there's a God. How many people believe God loves them. I mean, we're still talking up in the 90%. In America. But as you start to define what that means, it drops drastically. To actual born again believers in America, below 30% or around 30%? Because as you start asking them more questions, they define God their own way and they start to fall off then. But James says, hey, man, if you, don't have, if you don't have works, you have a dead faith. And you're thinking, man, Glenn's going to teach a works mentality, a works faith. James does. The brother of Jesus said, if you don't have an active faith, it's dead. You know, we live in an area, and especially this time of year, when animals are coming out of their little hiding places for the winter. You drive down the road, it's like a killing field sometimes. There are raccoons and possums laying all over the place. If you drive down at night, you'll see them scurrying all over the road. Guess which ones are alive and which ones are dead? The ones not moving are dead. The ones that are moving are still alive. In case you didn't know. Guess what, my beloved brother? And if you aren't moving in the power, if you are not moving in your faith, if you are not living it out, you have a dead faith. If it's not active in your life, it's dead. We need to be revived. We need personal revival in our, in, our, in our life. That's what it means to be brought back, to, to be woke up. We're supposed to be alive in Christ, not dead in Christ. Verse 19 in James again, chapter 2, he says, You believe there is one God. You do well. <laughs> Great, man. You believe there's one God. Awesome. Awesome. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. The de you believe as well as a demon. You know, there, there's no agnostic or atheist demons. They all believe. They all believe. When they would see Jesus... 
Son of the Most High God, why are you here? Why are you going to torment us now? It's not time yet, blah, blah, blah. They would cry out, and, and you knew who it was. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. James evidently was a little sarcastic. He says, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Do you want to know that? Probably not. Nobody wants to know that what they thought was okay isn't. I'm going to tell you, if you stay in God's word and you study it and you read it and, and, and you take it in, you're going to find things that need to change in your life for the rest of your life. Until you stand in his presence and are made perfect, this word is going to challenge you. Do you want to know what it is? Are you willing to be like David and say, search me and see if there's any evil thing in me? And if it is, Lord, take it. Is my focus in the wrong spot? If it is, correct it. Are you willing to do that? Or are you just going to say, man, Lord, I know I, this is good. There's nothing wrong with this direction. There's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. So take me down this road. Let's go. You come with me. Instead of you go before me. Go before me and make the way. I'm going to follow you. And we get ahead of God so much. And then we turn around and we tell him what they do like he's some kind of genie in a bottle. Go with him. Go behind him. Let him clear the way. You know, I had, I had two hunting dogs. Two labs. And they weren't waterfowl dogs. I wasn't a waterfowl hunter hunt upland birds they would get in there and one one would crash the brush man he didn't care if he thought he smelled a bird in a in a brush pile he was in it he'd make a hole and the other one would go right in behind him that that brush crasher the oldest one zeke he died and i'd take sam with me and we got into heavy stuff every time we'd get into heavy stuff and he'd fall right in behind me. I'm like, dude, man, the birds are out. You got to go out there. Your job is to go out in front. Nope, my job is right behind you, man. You clear the path. It's what we need to do. We need to get in behind God, let him clear the path of where we're supposed to go. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? He believed he had great faith. He had left his homeland. He had gone to where God had told him to. He had been traveling all of that. That showed his faith in, in God. When God showed up and said, you're going to follow me. I want you to go where I'm going to show you to go. Abraham leaves without direction. Just goes. Leave your home. Leave your family and go. Right? And then he gets to this place and God makes a promise. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an heir. And after Isaac is born, through all of those stories and those chapters, God says, you know what? I want you to take your son, your only son. I want you to go up on this mountain where I tell you to go. And I want you to sacrifice him. Yeah, but he's the son of promise. He's the one the Messiah is supposed to come through. For three days, Abraham walks with Isaac. In Abraham's mind, he's already dead. He made the decision. As soon as he made the decision to go, Isaac was dead. He takes him up on that mountain. He lays him on the altar. Isaac said, where's the sacrifice? Before he gets on the altar. God will provide himself a sacrifice. And that statement. That phrase can be read both ways in the original. Two ways. God will provide himself. The sacrifice. As the sacrifice. Or God will provide himself a sacrifice. Abraham. Believed. 
And we know from other verses that Abraham believed that if he had to follow through with this, God was going to raise him from the dead. He wasn't going to change his direction because of this. He had enough faith in God to know that Isaac, the promise was coming through Isaac, had to be. And he trusted God with his own promise. And he trusted God with his son. And he took him up. And he was ready to go, man. He was ready to, and I I don't believe Abraham was cold. He was probably weeping as he's ready to do it. But he knows, one, he's acting out prophecy. He's acting out what the father was going to do with his own son. And he believed that God would raise Isaac from the dead. Which means he believed that the the ultimate, the son of God, would come back. That the true son of promise, the Messiah, was going to sacrifice, going to be sacrificed by the father for the sins of the world. But he would stand again that he would come back to life, that he would be resurrected again to reign as the king. Abraham believed that. Abraham was justified by his faith, or his faith was justified by his works, by his willingness to do what God told him to do. Do you see that faith was working together, he says here, with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? Think of the picture that we have. We've been through that story before in great detail. All of the details of that story point to the cross, point to, it's the same mountain, Mount Moriah, Mount Golgotha, it's the same place. Every detail that Abraham and Isaac acted out pointed to the cross. It was made perfect. His faith was made perfect. In the scripture, 23, the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a a man is justified by works and not by faith only. So you can say you believe all day long. But if you're not willing to walk in in that faith, to do the things that point to Jesus, to minister to the poor and the needy. And listen, I realize there are people out here who take these verses and they don't talk anything about the poor and needy. The poor and needy to them are, are we're going to do miracles. It's all health and and wealth. And if you believe enough, you'll be wealthy. If you believe enough, you'll be healed. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying if you're a servant of the Most High God, you're going to go out and you're going to get your hands dirty. You're going to go out and you're going to touch people where they live. You're not going to go out and make a joke out of Jesus. You're going to be ready when they come into the building. You're going to welcome them like it's our home, welcoming them into our home. And you're going to go out there and you're going to meet the widow and the orphan in their trouble, in their place. The lost. You're going to share the gospel. And it's not about filling this building, but man, I hope you guys would invite people to come here. But we... The lost need to know there's a place where they can find the mercy. Where they can find forgiveness for their sins. Again, when we talked about this on Easter Sunday, I believe. 44, over 44,000 people in our nation alone commit suicide every year. I don't mean to belittle this, but we're worried about a couple hundred cases of measles that haven't killed anybody. 44,000 people are taking their lives. 
every year, probably more. I mean, that was from, that statistic, I think, was from 2014. Because there's no hope. The world doesn't deliver hope. All it delivers is an escape from reality. And when they wake up to the reality, then there's no hope. And it's just. And and we're we're taking this a step further, man. I got fired up on my way to church because I heard that they're trying to legalize psychedelics now because they're not addictive and they don't do anything. And they're all natural. And and nobody should have to be able to. We shouldn't expect that anybody could just live in this life without some kind of relief. What? Not the man-made ones, because those cause problems. Just the, the mushrooms and the other plants that cause. All right. Well, first of all, any church that grabs a hold of that, you hear any Christian grab a hold of that, and they will. You just point to sorcery in the Bible. Because God says, that I despise. It's called pharmakia. It's where we get our word pharmacy from. Drugs, anything that alters our reality and takes us, it, it takes us away from God. I don't care what message you get on some astral plane. doesn't matter. It's not going to be true message from God. His message is by my grace you overcome the world. You don't have to escape reality. Abraham fulfilled scripture. Abraham was justified by his works. His faith was made open for everybody. Can you imagine, Sarah? Where are you guys going? Well, God's taking us to this mountain three days away. What are you going to do there? We're going to make a sacrifice. Huh. Where's the lamb? You don't want to know. <laughs> Can you imagine? Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body is without for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So you take two people in the history of Israel, the greatest Abraham, Father Abraham, Rahab the harlot. Father Abraham, Rahab the harlot. Who took in the spies from Joshua? Who hid them? Who told them about the fear of, of the Israelites and their God because they'd heard the stories and they'd seen what they did to the giants on the other side. They knew about it. And Jericho was afraid. And Rahab says, they're afraid of you. But I want to come and be a part of you. I want to serve your God. The rich and wealthy can be saved. The poor, the destitute, the prostitute can be saved. And Rahab's life changed. She didn't stay a prostitute. She's in the lineage of Jesus. She's the great-great-grandmother of King David. Guess what? James has her blood running through his body. He had the blood of both, Abraham and Rahab, coursing through his veins. He's talking to Jews, a Jewish church in Jerusalem. You have these two inside of you. Well, they don't have Rahab necessarily, but you have Abraham. But guess what? Some of you have Rahab too. And that wasn't two factions at war inside of James. There were two who needed the faith of God, the faith in God, 
And you need to take that faith and put it into, into action. And they did it. And James says, the body without the spirit, just like a body without a spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. You know, done a lot of funerals. So far, I haven't seen anybody get up out of a casket and start making arrangements at their own funeral. They don't carry in the flowers. They don't carry the casket. None of that. I'm hoping for a day. You guys know me. I'm a little sick and twisted that, you know, I could be doing a funeral for a brother or sister in the Lord and, and the trumpet will blow while we're doing the funeral and they'll sit up and, you know, or maybe you'll all be doing mine. I don't know. I just, I want, I, I want to see people freak out right before we go. That's all. I just, that's me. But, the dead don't do anything. A dead body doesn't do anything. It just continues to decay. A dead faith, a faith without works, a faith that's not active is a dead faith. It needs to be active. We need to be active in doing for the Lord. Now, listen. There's all kinds of direction for that. Everything you do, you do as unto the Lord. We're told that. Everything. You do your job. I don't care what your job is. You do it as unto the Lord. That's above the boss. That's above the owner. If you're working toward Jesus and you're working for him and you're doing your job to honor him, man, it's going to bring honor to the others. Whether they accept it or not is another thing. But you're going to follow the rules. You're going to do what you're supposed to do. You're going to exceed the expectations. You're going to, that's going to be your goal. You're going to, you're going to want to honor God. It's going to look like you're honoring them, but really you're honoring God. You know, people say to you, why are you working so hard? Why are you, you're not getting paid enough to do all that. Ah, because I'm honoring God. I'm not worried about him. That's great. He gets all the recognition. He might get the credit, whatever. His production level looks good because my production level is good. Great, whatever. But really, it's not about him. It's about honoring God. And you've just witnessed to somebody. It's not, yeah, 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 this is just what I'm supposed to do. Eh, you know, this is how my dad taught me to work. It's not about that. I'm doing this to honor God. I believe God's put me here to do this job for this time. I'm doing it for him. See if you don't get some questions in about God. They're either going to be so attached to you, they can't figure you out, and they're going to be trying to figure you out, and they're going to ask you all kinds of questions that are going to lead to all kinds of other opportunities, or they're going to be like, whoa, back up, stay away from him, and they're going to be out of your way, and you can do your job probably better. But when there's a need in their life, when there's a catastrophe in their life, when things get hard, who do you think they're going to come to? They're going to be like, hey, can you pray for me? I don't know your God. Can you pray for me? Yeah, I can. But how about if you get to know my God? And you can pray. We can pray together. You know his word says about that? We're two or more gathered together in his name. There he is. He promises, man, if you don't get the answer you, you want, you're still going to get an answer, and he'll go through this with you. You're not going to go through it alone. And you're not going to understand everything, but you're going to know the love of God. And one day you're going to be with him forever. And you'll get a bunch of yeah buts. Yeah, but what about? Yeah, but what about nothing? What about right now? What about you? Let's take care of you first. 
Then we'll worry about the yeah buts after that. Man, I'll break open the Bible with you on the lunch break. I'll, you see where this can all go, how it just snowballs? And what are you doing? You're preaching the gospel everywhere you go, and you're making disciples. What we're supposed to do. And why do we do it? Because we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor is ourself. And you're fulfilling the commandments, the greatest commandments. And your faith is alive. And it's active. And the power of God is flowing through you. And I'm telling you what, you'll be more hungry for his word than you ever have been before. Even if you think you are now, you won't, you start walking like that and doing that. I'm telling you. We're going to take communion. Have the worship team come up. And this is where it starts. Did it get you guys your stuff? It didn't. Did it? Oh, it's right there. Okay. This is where it begins. This is where Jesus sat down with his disciples on that last Passover. And he took what they call the cup of redemption. And he took it and he set it and he handed it to him. He said, drink this. And he took that matzah, that unleavened bread, and he broke it. He said, this is my body. And the cup, this is my blood. And we're going to read through 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26 in just a second. Doing this doesn't make you saved. It's getting to the point where you believe. It's coming to believe in him and to trust him with your life. Not just to believe that Jesus is real. Not just to believe in God. But to believe you're a sinner. We've all been sinners. We all fell short of the glory of God. All of us. And even as believers, we still struggle every day with our own flesh, our own desires, our own wants. But we know God, we know that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We know that. And we have an assurance in our faith that we have not lost our faith because we mess up. We have not lost our salvation because of that. But you can't live in that unless you are willing to admit that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Romans chapter 10. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. So you can say, I believe in the Lord. You can say, I believe in God. The question is, do you believe that God raised him from the dead? Because if you believe that, you also are believing that he died for a reason. And that reason was to be able to forgive you of your sin. He paid for the sin. The gospel accounts tell us that for three hours while he was on the cross, he was taking on the wrath of God. That's where he paid for our sin. When that three hours was done, when that darkness was released, after that three hours, he said, to tell us die. It's finished. Paid in full. That's what that means. He didn't have to go to hell and pay more. He told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus is the only one with the power and the authority to forgive sin. The only one. And he promises again in Romans chapter 10 that all who will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You say, I don't know what to pray. Just cry out to him. Just cry out to him. Just start speaking to Lord, God. Call him Lord. Admit that he's Lord, right? You have to confess that with your mouth. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord of everything. Everything is submission to him, including us. 
all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you will ask him to forgive you of your sin, he will save you. He will teach you. He'll show you to repent. He'll show you what that means to turn around and walk away from that sin. He'll reveal himself to you in his word. And your faith will begin to grow. And you'll have that active faith that we talked about today. Alive. New. Something new in you. And it's God. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit. So if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, that's the priority right now. Not a little bit of juice and and and, and a piece of unleavened bread. As important as this is, it doesn't save you. You need to be saved first. It's only for believers. And the story of that Passover, that Last Supper, we like to call it, is in the Gospels. But Paul delivers it very clearly to a Gentile church. We should speak to all of us. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was, uh, he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup, or this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for going to the cross for us, for being the sacrifice that we needed. Lord, thank you for forgiving us of our sins, for convicting us, bringing conviction, bringing that sense of needing to repent every day. for correcting us as your children and not judging us anymore as the lost. Now, Lord, I pray that you would empower us. Give us direction every day to walk according to your word, to reach out and to meet the needs as we can, as you provide to those who are around us. Lord, may we, by the power of your Holy Spirit, see the opportunities and have the boldness again by the power of the Holy Spirit to act in faith toward those. That we would embrace every opportunity you put in front of us. That we would know what is from you and what is not. That we would not just have knowledge, but Lord, that we would be able to take the knowledge that you've given us and now acquire wisdom from you and know how to walk in that knowledge. Lord, we want to be a church that is alive. We want to have a faith that is alive. In these last days when so many are heading to judgment. And so many are lost. May we have the strength to stand. Lord, even if it feels like, seems like, looks like we're not making any difference. But we would be able to stand knowing that we're honoring you. 
and remembering that your word says that it does not return void. It doesn't return empty. And on that promise, may we be inspired to continue to speak your word and to walk in your will for our lives. And may we remember you every moment of every day. Lord, thank you for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.